refraction, bending, as opposed to reflection. This is refraction, the bending of light. Most of us have seen a rainbow when sunlight hits droplets of water in the air. Sunlight is bent or refracted as it passes through a raindrop. Longer wavelengths of light, red, are bent the least, and the shorter wavelengths of light, violet, are bent the most. This photo of a group of hikers and a rainbow was taken in Yosemite National Park in California along the Mist Trail overlooking Vernal Falls. Chapter 14, Overview, Refraction. Investigates which direction light will bend when it enters another medium and uses Snell's Law to solve problems. Section 2, Thin Lenses, solves problems involving image formation by converging and diverging lenses using ray diagrams and the thin lens equation, explores eye disorders and eyeglasses, and examines the positioning of lenses in microscopes and refracting telescopes. Optical phenomena calculates critical angle, predicts when total internal reflection will occur, explains atmospheric phenomena, including mirages and rainbows, and briefly describes lens aberrations. Knowledge to review. Wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. Reflection is the turning back of an electromagnetic wave at the surface of a substance. The focal point is the point at which a beam parallel to the principal axis will converge after reflection from a concave mirror. The focal length is the distance from the focal point to the mirror. Spherical aberration is an effect in which the image produced by a spherical mirror is blurred. It results from light rays converging at different points when the mirror is not parabolic. Sine function. Ask what the highest value is that the sine of an angle may have and what the angle is at the value 1.9 degrees. Chapter preview. Section 1, refraction, is broken into two subsections, refraction of light and the law of refraction. Section 2, Thin Lenses, is a very busy section, five subsections, types of lenses, characteristics of lenses, the thin lens equation and magnification, eyeglasses and contact lenses, and combination of thin lenses. Section 3, Total Internal Reflection, Atmospheric Refraction, Dispersion, and Lens Aberration. So four subsections to section three. What to expect? <clears throat> In this chapter, you will study optical phenomena associated with the refraction of light as it passes from one transparent medium to another. You will learn how to analyze converging and diverging lenses. You will then better understand how optical devices work, why it matters, optical devices such as cameras, microscopes, and telescopes use the principles of reflection and refraction to create images that we can then use for many artistic and scientific applications. An understanding of how lenses function is also essential to the practice of optometry. Section 1, Refraction. Three objectives. Recognize situations in which refraction will occur. Identify which direction light will bend when it passes from one medium to another, and solve problems using Snell's Law. The flower looks small when viewed through the water droplet. The light from the flower is bent because of the shape of the water droplet and the change in material as the light passes through the water. Refraction of light. Look at the tiny image of the flower that appears in the water droplet in figure 1. The blurred flower can be seen in the background of the photo. Why does the flower look different when viewed through the droplet? This phenomena occurs because light is bent 
at the boundary between the water and the air around it. The bending of light as it travels from one medium to another is called refraction. Refraction is the bending of a wave front as the wave front passes between two substances in which the speed of the wave differs. Figure 2, when light moves from one medium to another, part of it is reflected and part is refracted. A, when the light ray moves from air into glass, the refracted portion is bent toward the normal. B, whereas the path of the light ray moving from glass into air is bent away from the normal. Figure 2, visual strategy, point out that a portion of the incident light is reflected. Make sure students realize that all angles are measured relative to the normal. Remind students that the normal is an imaginary line drawn perpendicular to the surface. Question, what is the angle between the normal line and the boundary between air and water? 90 degrees. If light travels from one transparent medium to another at any angle other than straight on, normal to the surface, the light ray changes direction when it meets the boundary. As in the case of reflection, the angle of the incoming and refracted rays are measured with respect to the normal. For studying refraction, the normal is extended into the refracting medium as shown in figure 2. The angle between the refracted ray and the normal is called the angle of refraction, theta r, and the angle of incident is designated as theta i. Refraction occurs when light's velocity changes. Glass, water, ice, diamonds, and quartz are all examples of transparent media through which light can pass. The speed of light in each of these materials is different. The speed of light in water, for instance, is less than the speed of light in air, and the speed of light in glass is less than the speed of light in water. When light moves from a material in which its speed is higher to a material which the speed is lower, such as from air to glass, the ray is bent toward the normal, as shown in figure 2a. If the ray moves from a material in which the speed is lower to, to one in which its speed is higher, as in figure 2b, the ray is bent away from the normal. If the incident ray of light is parallel to the normal, then no refraction bending occurs in either case. Note that the path of a light ray that crosses a boundary between two different media is reversible. If the ray in figure 2a originated inside the glass block, it would follow the same path as shown in the figure, but the reflected ray would be inside the block. A plane wave traveling in air, A, has a wavelength of lambda air and a velocity of the air. Each wave front turns as it strikes the glass. Because the speed of the wave front in the glass, B, V glass, is slower, the wavelength of the light becomes shorter and the wave front changes direction. Study this carefully. It's going to be important when we do an experiment. Refraction can be explained in terms of the wave mo model of light. In the previous chapter on light and reflection, you learned how to use wave fronts and light rays to approximate light waves. This analogy can be extended to light passing from one medium into another. The speed of light in a vacuum, C, 
is an important constant used by physicists. It, is, it has been measured to be about 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second inside of other mediums such as air, glass, water, and the speed of light is different and is less than C. In figure 3, the wave fronts are shown in red and are assumed to be spherical. The combined wave front dotted line connecting the individual wave fronts is a superposition of all the spherical wave fronts. The direction of propagation of the wave is perpendicular to the wave front and is what we call the light ray. Consider wave fronts of a plane wave of light traveling at an angle to the surface of a block of glass as shown in figure 3. Misconception alert. Students may think that the frequency of light changes as light enters a different medium. Point out that the frequency cannot change if the refracted frequency were less than the incident frequency wave crests would have to pile up somewhere. If the refracted frequency were greater than the incident frequency, wave crests would have to pop up from nowhere. As the light enters the glass, the wave fronts slow down, but the wave fronts that have not yet reached the surface of the glass continue traveling at the speed of light in air. During this time, the slower wave fronts travel a smaller distance than do the wave fronts in the air, so the entire plane wave changes directions. Note the difference in wavelength, the space between the wave fronts, between the plane wave in the air and the plane wave in the glass. Because the wave fronts inside the glass are traveling more slowly in the same time interval, they move through a shorter distance than the wave fronts that are still traveling in air. Thus, the wavelength of the air in the glass, lambda glass, is shorter than the wavelength of the incoming light, lambda air. The frequency of the light does not change when the light passes from one medium to another. A good way to do this when you read is to make a sketch of what's going on to keep track of the terms. The law of refraction. An important property of transparent substances is the index of refraction. Index of refraction, the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in a given transparent medium. So the index of refraction for a substance is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in that substance. Index of refraction, n equals c over v. Index of refraction equals speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in a medium. Here is table indices of refraction for various substances. Notice cubic zirconium is 2.2, diamond is 2.4, so you can easily tell the difference if you measure the index of refraction. Water should be about 1.3, that's 1.33, etc. So study the table. It will be useful. Uh, notice air is nearly equal to 1, and so is carbon dioxide. From this definition, we see that the index of refraction is a dimensionless number that is always greater than 1 because light always travels slower in a substance than in a vacuum. Table 1 lists the indices of refraction of different substances. Did you know the index of refraction of any medium can be expressed as the ratio of the wavelength of light in a vacuum to the, to the wavelength of light in that medium as shown in the following relation. So that's going to be lambda naught over lambda n lambda naught over lambda n. Note that the larger the index of refraction is, the slower light travels in that substance 
and the more a light ray will bend when it passes from a vacuum into that material. Imagine as an example light passing between air and water. Note that the larger the index of refraction is, the slower light travels in that substance and the more a light ray will bend when it passes from a vacuum into that material. Imagine as an example light passing between air and water. When light begins to when light begins in the air, high speed and of light and low index of refraction and travels into water, low speed of light and higher index of refraction, the light rays are bent toward the normal. Conversely, when light passes from the water to the air, the light rays are bent away from the normal. Note that the value for the index of refraction of air is nearly that of a vacuum. For simplicity, use the value n equals 1.00 for air when solving problems. Figure 4, A, to the cat on the pier, the fish looks closer to the surface than it really is. B, to the fish, the cat seems to be farther from the surface than it actually is. Objects appear to be in different positions due to refraction. When looking at a fish underwater, a cat sitting on a pier perceives the fish to be closer to the water surface than it actually is, as shown in figure 4a. Conversely, the fish perceives the cat on the pier to be farther from the water's surface than it actually is, as shown in figure 4b. Because of the reversibility of refraction, both the fish and the cat see along the same path, as shown by the solid lines in both figures. However, the light ray that reaches the fish forms a smaller angle with respect to the normal than does the light ray from the cat to the water's surface. The reason is that light is bent towards the normal when it travels from a medium with a lower index of refraction, the air, to one with a higher index of refraction, the water. Extending this ray along a straight line shows the cat's image to be above the cat's actual position. On the other hand, the light ray that reaches the cat from the water's surface forms a larger angle with respect to the normal because the light from the fish travels from a medium with a higher index of refraction to one with a lower index of refraction. Note that the fish's image is closer to the water surface than the fish actually is. An underwater object seen from the air above appears larger than its actual size because the image, which is the same size as the object, is closer to the observer. All right, conceptual challenge. First, The Invisible Man. H.G. Wells wrote a famous novel about a man who made himself invisible by changing his index of refraction. What would his index of refraction have to be to accomplish this? Visibility for the invisible man. Would the invisible man be able to see anything? And three, fishing. When trying to catch a fish, should a pelican dive into the water horizontally in front of or behind the image of the fish it sees? Answers. One, it would have to have an index of refraction of air. If his index of refraction were any larger, the images behind him would appear distorted, giving away his position. Visibility for the invisible man? No, he would not because light rays would not be bent by his cornea or lens. Thus, no image would be formed on his retina. The fishing question, in front of the image, because the light from the fish bends away from the normal as it enters the air. Wavelengths affect the index of refraction. 
Note that the indices of refraction listed in Table 1 are only valid for light that has a wavelength of 589 nanometers in a vacuum. The reason is that the amount that light bends when entering a different medium depends on the wavelength of the light as well as the speed. Thus, the, in, the spectrum is produced when white light passes through a prism. Each color of light has a different wavelength. Therefore, each color of the spectrum is refracted by a different amount. Snell's law determines the angle of refraction. The index of refraction of a material can be used to figure out how much array of light will be refracted as it passes from one medium to another. As mentioned, the greater the index of refraction, the more refraction occurs. But how can the angle of refraction be found? In 1621, Willerboard Snell experimented with light passing through different media. He developed a relationship called Snell's Law, which can be used to find the angle of refraction for light traveling between any two media. Snell's Law is n sub i sine theta i equals n sub r sine theta r. The index of refraction of the first media times the sine of the angle of incidence equals the index of refraction of the second media times the sine of the angle of refraction. A light ray of wavelength 589 nanometers produced by sodium lamp traveling through air strikes a smooth flat slab of crown glass at an angle of 30 degrees to the normal. Find the angle of refraction. All right, here's what's listed. You've got to find the angle of refraction. You can use Snell's Law, and you will list Snell's Law, the equation on the next slide, the, the givens, and then on the next slide, you'll list the Snell's Law, and you're going to solve for the angle of refraction using the arc sign, and then you'll plug in, and you get the angle of refraction to be 19.2 degrees. Find the angle of refraction for a ray of light that enters a bucket of water from air at an angle of 25 degrees to the normal. Use table 1. So we want to know the angle of refraction. So you're going to need to use water, uh, sorry, air, and then look up water, and then solve for the angle of refraction. So that's going to be N for, for water is 1.33. The the index of refraction for air is 1. Plug in, list the equation, rearrange, plug in, and you get 18.5 degrees as the angle of refraction. For an incoming ray of light, a, a vacuum wavelength 589 nanometers, fill in the unknown values in the table. Hint, use table 1. So you have, uh, you have flint glass crown glass, diamond, and air. So you want to you want to fill in that table. Let's look at that table a little bit more closely. So what you're actually going to be doing is using Snell's law three different times looking for a different value each time. And so you want to set up literally three problems in order to find this. So you're going to need to use table 1 and look up the indices of refraction for each substance, the flint glass, the crown glass, the air, uh, etc. And then you're going to uh, set up Snell's Law and solve the various problems in order to fill in the charts. All right, here is Snell's Law that popped up on the screen there. So now we rearrange for the angle of refraction as we did before. Now here's 2a, this is the first one, and you'll plug in. You'll plug those values into that equation, and there's the plug-ins, and then you'll solve, and you get 27.5 degrees for the first one. And then 
you want to do to B. And you put, there are the givens, there's the equation. I want to solve for the index of refraction, N sub R, plug in your values, and you get 1.47, which is glycerin. And then to C, there's your values from the table. And here we want to do the angle of refraction. That's the only one that's missing. And list your equation, rearrange it, plug in, and you get 12.5 degrees. Okay, a ray of light of vacuum wavelength 550 nanometers traveling in air enters a slab of transparent material. The incoming ray makes an angle of 40 degrees with the normal, and the refracted ray makes an angle of 26 degrees with the normal. Find the index of refraction of the transparent material. Assume that the index of refraction of air for light of wavelength 550 nanometers is 1. All right, here's what's given, the angle of incident, angle of refraction, and the index of ref incident, 1, that's going to be air. You're going to list your equation. You're going to plug in, and you're going to get 1.47. Sunlight passes into a raindrop at an angle of 22.5 degrees from the normal at one point on the droplet. What is the angle of refraction? Again, here we have the values. And we're going to rearrange and plug in. And we're going to get 16.7 degrees. OK, for each of the following cases, will light rays be bent toward or away from the normal? Ni is greater than Nr is A, where theta i equals 20 degrees. Ni is less than Nr, where theta i equals 20 degrees. From air to glass, with an angle of incident of 30 degrees. From glass to air, with an incident angle of incidence of 30 degrees. So, what is it going to be? What's A? Now let's repeat the question. For each of the following cases, will light bend toward or away from the normal? Okay, first one, it will bend away from the normal. Next, it will bend toward the normal. Air to glass, high to low, toward the normal. And the glass to air, will bend away from the normal. Find the angle of refraction of a ray of light that enters a diamond from air at an angle of 15 degrees to the normal. Here are the givens. Here is the equation set up to solve. Plug in and calculate. The answer is 6.14 degrees. Critical thinking. In which of the following situations will light from a laser be refracted? Traveling from air into a diamond at an angle of 30 degrees to the normal. Traveling from water into ice along the normal. Upon striking a metal surface. Traveling from air into glass of iced tea at an angle of 20 degrees to the normal. So, which one is it going to be? A, definitely A. What's left? Anything else? And D. Striking a metal surface is just kind of silly. Uh, section 2, thin lenses. Use ray diagrams to find the position of an image produced by a converging or diverging lens and identify the image as real or virtual. Solve problems using the thin lens equation. Calculate the magnification of lenses. Describe the positioning of lenses in compound microscopes and refracting telescopes. Types of lenses. When light traveling in air enters a pane of glass, it is bent towards the normal. 
as the light exits the pane of glass, it is bent again. When the light exits, however, its speed increases as it enters the air, so the light bends away from the normal. Because the amount of refraction is the same regardless of whether light is entering or exiting the medium, the light rays are bent as much on exiting the pane of glass as they are on entering. Curved surfaces change the direction of light. When the surfaces of a medium are curved, the direction of the normal line differs from for each spot on the surface of the medium. Thus, when light passes through a medium that has one or more curved surfaces, the change in the direction of the light ray varies from point to point. This principle is applied in the medium called lenses. Lens, a transparent object that, ref that refracts light rays such that they converge or diverge to create an image. Like mirrors, lenses form images, but lenses do so by refraction rather than by reflection. The image form can be either real or virtual, depending on the type of lens and on the placement of the object. Figure 5. When rays of light pass through A, a converging lens, thicker at the middle, they are bent inward. When they pass through B, a diverging lens, thicker at the edges, they are bent outwards. Recall that a real image is formed when rays of light actually intersect to form the image. Virtual images form at a point from which light rays appear to come but do not actually come. Real images can be projected onto a screen. Virtual Im images cannot. Lenses are commonly used to form images in optical instruments, such as cameras, telescopes, and microscopes. In fact, transparent tissue in the form of the human eye acts as a lens, converging light towards the light-sensitive retina, which lines the back of the eye. A typical lens consists of a piece of glass or plastic ground so that each of its two refracting surfaces is a segment of either a sphere or a plane. Figure 5 shows examples of lenses. Notice that the lenses are shaped differently. The lens that is thicker at the middle than it is at the rim, shown in figure 5a, is an example of a converging lens. The lens that is thinner at the middle than it is at the rim, shown in figure 5b, is an example of a diverging lens. The light rays show why the names converging and diverging are applied to these lenses. This is figure 6. By A, converging lens, and B, diverging lens, have two focal points, but only one focal length. Study figure 6 very carefully, and it may not be evident at first, but you can actually see the lens and notice the focal points and the focal lengths. Focal length is the image distance for an infinite object distance. As with mirrors, it is convenient to define a point called the focal point for a lens. Note that light rays from an object far away are nearly parallel. The focal point of a converging lens is the location where the image of an object at an infinite distance from the lens is focused. For example, in figure 6a, a group of rays parallel to the principal axis passes through a focal point f after being bent inward by the lens. 
unlike mirrors, every lens has a focal point on each side of the lens because light can pass through the lens from either side, as illustrated in Figure 6. The distance from the focal point to the center of the lens is called the focal length, or F. Look back at Figure 6 and see if that makes sense, what I just read. The focal length is the image distance that corresponds to an infinite object distance. Rays parallel to the principal axis diverge after passing through the diverging lens as shown in figure 6b. In this case, the focal point is defined as the point from which the diverging rays appear to originate. Again, the focal length is defined as the distance from the center of the lens to the focal point. Ray diagrams of thin lens systems help identify image height and location. In the chapter on light and reflection, we used a set of standard rays and a ray diagram to predict the characteristics of images formed by spherical mirrors. A similar approach can be used for lenses. Again, look back at figure 6, look at 6a and b, and see if you can make sense out of what was just read by looking at figure 6. Here is table 2, rules for drawing reference rays. Study this one especially carefully because you will be responsible for drawing the solutions to some of the problems that are listed relative to ray diagrams. We know, as shown in figure 5, that Refraction occurs at a boundary between two materials with different indexes of refraction. However, for thin lenses, lenses for which the thickness of the lens is small compared to the radius of curvature of the lens or the distance of the object from the lens, we can represent the front and back boundaries of the lens as a line segment passing through the center of the lens. To draw ray diagrams in the thin lens approximation, we will use a line segment with arrow ends to indicate a converging lens, as in figure 6a. To show a diverging lens, we will draw a line segment with upside-down arrows ends, as illustrated in 6b. We can then draw ray diagrams using the set of rules outlined in Table 2. The reason why these rules work relate to concepts already covered in this textbook. From the definition of a focal point, we know that light traveling parallel to the principal axis, parallel ray, will be focused at the focal point. For a converging lens, this means that the light will come together at the focal point in the back of the lens. In this book, the front of the lens is defined as the side of the lens that the light rays first encounter. The back of the lens refers to the side of the lens opposite where the light rays first encounter the lens. But a similar ray passing through a diverging lens will exit the lens as if it originated from the focal point in front of the lens. Because refraction is re reversible, a ray entering a converging lens from either focal point will be refracted so that it is parallel to the principal axis. For both lenses, a ray passing through the center of the lens will continue in a straight line with no net refraction. This occurs because both sides of the lens are parallel to one another along any path through the center of the lens. As with a pane of glass, the exiting ray will be parallel to the ray that first entered the lens. For ray diagrams, the usual assumption is that the lens is neg negligibly thin. Easy for you to say. So it is assumed that the ray is not displaced sideways, but instead continues in a straight line. 
Characteristics of lenses. Table 3 summarizes the possible relationships between object and image positions for converging lenses. The rules for drawing reference rays were used to create each of these diagrams. Note that applications are listed along with each ray diagram to show the varied uses of the different configurations. Converging lenses can produce real or virtual images of real objects. An object infinitely far away from a converging lens will create a point image at the focal point, as shown in the first diagram in Table 3. This image is real, which means that it can be projected on a screen. It's important to look at Table 3 and some of the other figures uh, to help with the reading. So go back and forth. It will be very helpful. As a distant object approaches the focal point, the image becomes larger and farther away, as shown in the second, third, and fourth diagrams in Table 3. When the object is at the focal point, as shown in the fifth diagram, the light rays from the objects are refracted so that they exist, so they exit the lens parallel to each other. Because the object is at the focal point, it is impossible to draw a third ray that passes through the focal point, the lens, and the tip of the object. When the object is between the converging ray and the focal point, the light rays from the object diverge when they pass through the lens, as shown in the sixth diagram in Table 3. Look back at Table 3 and see if that all makes sense. This image appears to an observer in back of the lens as being on the same side of the lens as the object. In other words, the brain interprets these diverging rays as coming from an object directly along the path of the rays that reach the eye. The ray diagram for this final case is less straightforward than those drawn for the other cases in the table. The first two rays, parallel to the axis and through the center of the lens, are drawn in the usual fashion. Misconception alert. Students might wonder about the need for diverging lenses because virtual lenses are also formed with converging lenses as shown in the sixth case in Table 3. Ask them to compare the object's location when using each kind of lens for creating a virtual image. A diverging lens creates a virtual image of objects at any distance in front of it. The converging lens can do that only for objects inside F, and this virtual image is always magnified. The image produced by a diverging lens is always virtual, smaller, and closer than the object regardless of the object's location. This last characteristic is useful for correcting nearsightedness with eyeglasses. Here are the different scenarios, number one from table three, and we'll just go through these slowly, about 10 seconds on each, and this is number two. Notice that where the object is, it's outside 2F, and the image is between F and 2F, and it's upside down or inverted, and this is at 2F, and the other one is at 2F, and they look like approximately the same size. So this will give you a good idea of where things are and how things are happening. You're really going to have to commit these to memory and do some drawings. Memory is important. It's not shouldn't be looked down upon. It's the beginning of learning. You have, to, you have to have something in your brain in order to think about it. So you should study these diagrams very, very carefully. And this is number six. And now, table three, the visual strategy. Point out that in the first case, the object is so far away that the rays from all its points top to bottom coverage at the focal point on the axis. In the other diagrams, rays are drawn from the object's top only and their intersection. 
after passing through the lens determines the image's top. The bottom is assumed to be on the axis at the same distance from the lens as the top. Question. Suppose that e in each case the lens focal length is 10 centimeters. What values or range of values will the object and distance image distances have for each case? Okay, you'll see up top, case one, object at infinity, etc. So this is the answer to, to the question where you have a focal length of 10. What about P and Q relative to that? Not exactly, but is it greater or smaller or even equal to it for each scenario? The third ray, however, is drawn so that if it were extended, it would connect the focal point in front of the lens, the tip of the object, and the lens in a straight line. To determine where the image is, draw lines extending from the rays exiting the lens back to the point where they would appear to have originated to an observer on the back side of the lens. These lines are dashed in the sixth diagram in table three. Diverging lenses produce virtual images from real objects. A diverging lens creates a virtual image of a real object placed anywhere with respect to the lens. The image is upright and the magnification is always less than one. That is, the image size is reduced. Additionally, the image appears inside the focal point for any placement of the real object. And this is figure seven. The image created by a diverging lens is always a virtual, smaller image. It's always virtual and smaller. The ray diagram shown in figure seven for diverging lenses was created using the rules given in table two. The first ray parallel to the axis appears to come from the focal point on the same side of the lens as the object. Did you know the lens of a camera forms an inverted image on the film in the back of the camera? Two methods are used to view this image before making a picture. In one, the system of mirrors and prisms reflects the image to the viewfinder, making the image upright in the process. In the other method, the viewfinder is a diverging lens that is separate from the main lens system. This lens forms an upright virtual image that resembles the image that will be projected onto the film. This ray is indicated by the oblique dashed line. The second ray passes through the center of the lens and is not refracted. The third ray is drawn as if it were going to the focal point in back of the lens. As this ray passes through the lens, it is refracted parallel to the principal axis and must be extended backwards, as shown by the dashed line. The location of the tip of the image is the point at which the three rays appear to have originated. Thin lens equation and magnification. Ray diagrams for lenses give a good estimate of image size and distance, but it is also possible to calculate these values. The equation that relates object and image distances for a lens is called the thin lens equation because it is derived using the assumption that the lens is very thin. In other words, this equation applies when the lens thickness is much smaller than its focal length. And here's the equation, thin lens equation. One over the distance from the object to the lens plus one over the distance from the image to the lens equals one over the focal length. Here is table four, sign conventions for lenses. Please study it carefully. Know what P, Q, and F are. And know the positive and negative signs, very important. 
when using the thin lens equation, we often illustrate it using the ray diagram model in which, for clarity, we magnify the vertical axis and show the lens position as a thin line. Always remember that the actual light rays bend at the lens surface and that our diagram showing bending at a single central line is an idealized model which is quite good for thin lenses but the model and the equation must be modified to deal properly with thick lenses systems of lenses and object and image points far from the principal axis. The thin lens equation can be applied to both converging and diverging lenses if we adhere to a set of sign conventions. Table 4 gives the sign conventions for lenses. Under this convention, an image is back of the lens, that is, a real image has a positive image distance and an image in front of the lens or a virtual image has a negative image distance. A converging lens has a positive focal length and a diverging lens has a negative focal length. Therefore, converging lenses are sometimes called positive lenses and diverging lenses are sometimes called negative lenses. Magnification by a lens depends on object and image distances. Recall that magnification M is defined as the ratio of image height to object height. The following equation can be used to calculate the magnification of both converging and diverging lenses. If close attention is given to the sign conventions defined in Table 4, then the magnification will describe the image's size and orientation. When the magnitude of the magnification of an object is less than 1, the image is smaller than the object down at the bottom. Conversely, when the magnitude of the magnification is greater than 1, the image is larger than the object. The equation magnification of a lens, m equals h prime, which is the height of the image, over h, the height of the object, which equals negative q over p. Therefore, the magnification equals the image height over the object height, which equals the distance from image to lens over the distance from object to lens. Additionally, a negative sign for the magnification indicates that the image is real and inverted. A positive magnification signifies that the image is upright and virtual. Misconception alert. Students may not be sure about all the cases shown in Table 4, particularly about the meaning of a negative distance for the object, which suggests that the object is in back of the lens. Some students may need to be reminded that according to these conventions, light rays always travel from the front to the back of the lens. Ask them if an object could be virtual. Point out that the real image formed by a converging lens may become a virtual object for another lens if the lens is located so that it interrupts the rays before they converge. Sample problem B for lenses. An object is placed 30 centimeters in front of a converging lens and then 12.5 centimeters in front of a diverging lens. Both lenses have a focal length of 10 centimeters. For both cases, find the image distance and the magnification. Describe the images. Hmm, let's see. First, let's write down what we have. We have the focal length for the converging and the object distance for the converging, the same information for the diverging. The unknown is the angle converging, the M, the magnification, and the angle for diverging, and M, the magnification. So now let's consider a diagram 
to see if we can understand what's happening and give us a clue to the answer. So here is the diagram. On the left is a converging lens and on the right is the diverging lens. Study them carefully and see if you can make sense and predict qualitatively what the quantitative equations will generate. Choose an equation or situation. The thin lens equation can be used to find the image distance and the equation for magnification will serve to describe the size and orientation of the object. I'll just let this run. Let you set up. Next thing we have to do is come up with the equation. And there it is. That's the equation 1 over P plus 1 over Q equals 1 over F. And you're going to solve for 1 over Q. Here's what you're given, the values. Now notice I put them the values in plus and minus in orange. You, it's very important that you keep track of all of that. And you find the Q for converging is plus 15 centimeters. And then you're going to do your magnification. And that's going to be 0.5 negative 0.5, watch your signs, and then for the diverging lens, you'll do the same process, and it'll be negative 5.56 for the Q for the diverging lens, and then the M you'll do next, and that will be approximately 0 0.5, 0 0.445, and that'll be positive these values and signs for the converging lens indicate a real inverted smaller image. And this is expected because the object distance is longer than twice the focal length of the converging lens. The value and signs for the diverging lens indicate a virtual upright smaller image and that's consistent with your drawing so the drawing is going to be simply part of the solution so formed inside the focal point this is only this is the only kind of image diverging lenses for so number one an object is placed 20 centimeters in front of a converging lens of focal length 10 centimeters, find the image distance and the magnification, describe the image. So you'll use the same formula you used. You're solving for 1 over Q and then solve for Q. So 1 over Q is going to be, here's the givens, and then you're going to say 1 over Q equals 1 over F minus 1 over P. You're going to plug in your values. Notice the signs. Use a colored pencil or pen, make sure the signs are there because those are the signs is really what will give it away. So it's real. And here's the here's the magnification. And it's going to be a good size. It'll be one. Uh, it'll be negative one. And so it'll be an inverted image because of the negative one. Sherlock Holmes examines a clue by holding his magnifying glass at arm's length and 10 centimeters away from an object. The magnifying glass has a focal length of 15 centimeters. Find the image distance and the magnification. Describe the image that he observes. So let's see. He examines a clue by holding the magnifying glass at arm's length at 10 centimeters away from an object. So P is going to be 10 centimeters. And it'll be positive. Usually it's always positive, the image, the object distance. Focal length is going to be positive, 15 centimeters. So now we'll plug in and we'll find Q. And Q is negative 30 centimeters and it's virtual. And the magnification is going to be It'll be three times the size, and it'll be positive three. So it will be an upright image. An object is placed 20 centimeters in front of a diverging lens of focal 
length 10 centimeters. Find the image distance and the magnification. Describe the image. All right, set things up. The object display so P is 20. And the focal length is 10. Make sure you put your signs in there. Look at the sign conventions. So the focal length is negative 10. That's important. So it'll be negative 6.67 centimeters. That's Q, so that makes it virtual. And then M equals negative Q over P. And that becomes negative and negative is positive. So it'll be positive 0.333. And it therefore is an upright image. Now, let's look at this table. Let's take a minute. So we have four problems. A, B, and C. So we have the focal length in Q for A and B. That's easy. We get P. And then we find M. And we have F and P. And we find Q and M for C. And we have P and M. That's going to be tricky. And we find we have to find F and Q. Given M. That's going to be good. We're going to have to utilize an equation we haven't used yet. And so, at this point, you want to get your data together, get your equations together, and see what you can do. All right, so A, we want to do the missing value. So F is plus 6 centimeters. Q is minus 3 centimeters. And uh, so you want to solve for P. And you solve for P, make sure you put in your signs. Makes things a little easier. So P is plus 2 centimeters, and that makes sense. The objects are usually positive. So M is going to be negative Q over P. So it'll be negative, negative is a positive, so it'll be an upright, larger image. And then B is going to be, there's F. I think it's going to be the same thing, B. We're going to solve for P, I think, yes. P and M. So there is P is plus 5 centimeters. And M is going to be, it'll be a negative value, negative 1.4. And then C, we're going to do, and then we're going to find, we have F, negative 6 centimeters. We have P, so we're going to find Q. Fairly straightforward. So that's what Q equals. 1 over minus 6 minus 1 over 4 is going to be negative 2.4. And then we'll find M. And we're almost there going to be a positive 0.6. And then the last one, D, that's going to be the tricky one. We have P and M, if I recall correctly. There's M and P. So I know that M is going to equal negative Q over P. So I can multiply M and P together. And I find that it's going to be a negative value because both P and M are positive. So it'll be, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll be negative 2.5 centimeters is Q. And we need to find F. And F is negative 5 centimeters. All right, here is table 5, farsighted and nearsighted. Farsighted, hyperopia, corrected with a converging lens. Study that carefully. Actually, I need some new glasses. I have to get this summer. So that's table five. And corrected with a converging lens, hyperopia. And myopia is corrected with a diverging lens. And that helps you see.
Okay, eyeglasses and contact lenses. The transparent front of the eye, called the cornea, acts like a lens, directing light rays towards the light-sensitive retina in the back of the eye. Although most of the refraction of light occurs at the cornea, the eye also contains a small lens called the crystalline lens that refracts light as well. When the eye attempts to produce a focused image of a nearby object, but the image position is behind the retina, the abnormality is known as hyperopia, and the person is said to be farsighted. With this effect, with this defect, distant objects are seen clearly, but near objects are blurred. Either the hyperopia, either the hyperop eye is too short or the ciliary muscle that adjusts the shape of the lens cannot adjust enough to properly focus the image. Table 5 shows how hyperopia can be corrected with a converging lens. Another condition known as myopia or nearsightedness occur, occurs either when the eye is longer than normal or when the maximum focal point of the lens is insufficient to produce a clear image on the retina. In this case, light from a distant object is focused in front of the retina. The distinguishing feature of this imperfection is that distant objects are not seen clearly. Nearsightedness can be corrected with a diverging lens as shown in Table 5. A contact lens is simply a lens worn directly over the cornea of the eye. The lens floats on a thin layer of tears. Combination of thin lenses. If two lenses are used to form an image, the system can be treated in the following manner. First, the image of the first lens is calculated as though the second lens were not present. The light then approaches the second lens as, it, as if it had come from the image formed by the first lens. Hence, the image formed by the first lens is treated as the object for the second lens. The image formed by the second lens is the final image of the system. The overall magnification of a system of lenses is the product of the magnifications of the separate lenses. If the image formed by the first lens is in back of the second lens, then the image is treated as a virtual object for the second lens. That is, P is negative, which is unusual. The same procedure can be extended to a system of three or more lenses. Compound microscopes use two converging lenses. A simple magnifier such as a magnifying glass, provides only limited assistance when inspecting the minute details of an object. Greater magnification can be achieved by combining two lenses in a device called a compound microscope. It consists of two lenses, an object lens near the object with a focal length of less than one centimeter and an eyepiece with a focal length of a few centimeters. As shown in figure 8, the object placed just outside the focal point of the object lens forms a real inverted and enlarged image that is at or just inside the focal point of the eyepiece. Here is figure 8 in a compound microscope, the real inverted image produced by the objective lens is used as the object for the eyepiece lens. All right, looking at figure eight again, visual, visual strategy, make sure that students transfer their understanding of the diagram to that of a real microscope. Here's the question. Normally, a microscope is placed in a vertical position. Redraw the diagram so that it represents a microscope in a vertical position. 
and indicate where you would place the slide. All right. On the answer, I have a, an image, and it's like that. And you place the slide at O, point O down at the bottom. You see the O? That's where you place the slide. The eyepiece, which serves as a simple magnifier, uses this enlarged image as its object and produces an even more enlarged vertical virtual image. The image viewed through the microscope is upside down with respect to the actual orientation of the specimen, as shown in Figure 8. The microscope is extended, has extended our vision into the previously unknown realm of incredibly small objects. <clears throat> a question that is often asked about microscopes is, with extreme patience and care, would it be possible to construct a microscope that would enable us to see an atom? As long as visible light is used to illuminate the object, the answer is no. Well, it's kind of, sort of. Look up tunneling microscope. Look up tunneling microscope. So it is possible, but the question is visible light. Okay, here's something about cameras. Cameras come in many types and sizes, from the small and simple point and shoot camera you might use to snap photos on a vacation to the large and complex video camera used to film a Hollywood motion picture. And here's a camera. The, the textbook is a little bit outdated because when this textbook was written, uh, cameras for phones and things were not as popular. Most cameras have at least one lens and more complex cameras have 30 or more lenses and may even contain mirrors and prisms. However, the simplest camera called a pinhole camera, going way back, consists of a closed, light, tight box with a small, about 0.5 millimeter, hole in it. And that was the pinhole camera. A surprisingly good image can be made with a pinhole camera. The film is placed on the wall opposite the hole and must be exposed for quite a long time because not much light passes through the hole making the hole a bit larger and adding a single converging lens and a shutter which opens and closes quickly to allow light to pass through the lens and expose the film can make another simple camera called a fixed focus camera. The film is located at the focal length of the lens and a typical disposable camera is of this kind. This type of camera usually gives good images only for objects far from the camera. For close objects, the focus falls behind the camera. Now, here's an old camera. It must be from, looks like it's from the 60s or 70s. Because the film location is fixed, the lens must be able to move away from the film and thus be focused. There are many types of camera lenses, and they are easily interchangeable on most single-lens reflex SLR cameras. You'll find that in fancy digital cameras where you have large lenses, the photography and the cameras, it's all very similar. A normal lens is one that provides about the same field of view as a human eye. Sometimes, however, a photographer wants to photograph distant objects with more detail or capture a larger object without taking multiple shots. A wide-angle lens has a very short focal length and can capture a large, larger field of view than a normal lens. A telephoto lens has a long focal length and increases magnification. Here's an example of a pinhole camera and the object is smaller and inverted. So what does that tell you about the lens and the diagram that you could draw relative to this particular camera? 
telephoto lenses have a narrow angle of view. Zoom lenses allow you to change the focal length without changing lenses. These cameras lenses contain multiple lenses that can be moved relative to one another. Here's a picture of a camera, the object, etc., your eye, and the real image that's formed. High quality cameras contain quite a few lenses, both converging and diverging, to minimize the distortions and aberrations that are created by a single converging lens. The most prevalent aberration occurs because lenses bend light of different colors by different amounts, causing in effect rainbows to appear in the image. You may be wondering how the optics change for digital cameras. The lens and shutters are essentially the same as those used in film cameras. There's an old-fashioned camera with the light bulb that you screw in. However, the film is replaced by a charged coupled device CCD array an array of tiny sensors that produce a current when hit by light from the subject being photographed. Lenses must still focus the light coming from the subject onto the CCD array as they must on film. In order to be seen, the object under a microscope must be at least as large as a wavelength of light. An atom is many times smaller than a wavelength of visible light, so its mysteries must be probed through other techniques. Now that slide may be confusing, but if you remember, it's going back to another slide which asked if a microscope can view an atom relative to putting in higher magnification, and the answer was no, etc., because of visible light, and I said tunneling microscope. But what I did was I put in a little bit of an arc I did a little bit of a uh, why it matters thing on cameras that's right from your book. So don't be confused by that odd placement of that slide. The image produced by the objective lens of a reflect refracting telescope is a real inverted image that is at its focal point. This inverted image in turn is the object from which the eyepiece creates a magnified virtual image. Now study this carefully and see if it makes sense relative to all that we've read. Refracting telescopes also use two converging lenses. As mentioned in the chapter on light and reflection, there are two types of telescopes, reflecting and refracting. In a refracting telescope, an image is formed at the eye in much the same manner as is done with a microscope. A small inverted image is formed at the focal point of the objective lens, F0, because the object is essentially at infinity. The eyepiece is positioned so that its focal point lies very close to the focal point of the objective lens, where the image is formed, as shown in Figure 9 because the image is now just inside the focal point of the eyepiece F sub E, the eyepiece acts like a simple magnifier and, and allows the viewer to examine the object in detail. Look back at figure 9 and see if that all makes sense. Section review. What type of image is produced by the cornea and the lens on the retina? What type of image is produced by the cornea and the lens on the retina? It will be real and inverted, and the brain makes it okay. What type of image, virtual or real, is produced in the following cases? A. An object inside the focal point of a camera lens. An object outside the focal point of a refracting telescope's objective lens. C. An object outside the focal point of a camera's viewfinder. The plot, as they say, when the plot's about to thicken, the plot is about to thicken. So,
let's think about A, an object inside the focal point of a camera lens. That will be virtual. An object outside would be real. And the last one, it will be virtual. Find the image position for an object placed three centimeters outside the focal point of a converging lens with a four centimeter focal length, f equals plus four centimeters. So what else? We're going to list our stuff and see if we can calculate it. All right. So P is going to be 3 centimeters plus 4 centimeters equals 7 centimeters. That's going to be P. And then we're going to find Q. So it's going to be 1 over positive 4 minus 1 over positive 7. That's going to be 1 over positive 9.3 centimeters, which will make it real. That's all they asked for. What is the magnification of the object from item 3? Now we're going to do the magnification. Even though we may have done that in class, we wouldn't just do the problem so simply. So let's now do the magnification. You want to list what you have. We know P, we know Q, and we calculate M. M is negative Q over P, so it'll be a negative 1.5. So that means that it will be inverted. Okay, next. Using a ray diagram, find the position and height of an image produced by a viewfinder in a camera with a focal length of 5 centimeters if the object is 1 centimeter tall and 10 centimeters in front of the lens. A camera viewfinder is a diverging lens. Okay. Let's think about what we're going to do. First, I think we should write down an equation. I like the equation first. OK. Here's the equation. There's m. So I have f, h, and p. And I'm going to find q. Notice the negative sign. So it's going to be negative 3.3 is q. m is going to be about a third plus 0.33 and now let's do the height so the height is going to be the height of the image is going to be 0.33 centimeters so that's h prime and then let's put it together here is the diagram okay compare the length of a refracting telescope with the sum of the focal lengths of its two lenses. All right. What do you want to say? Look it up. I'm just going to let this keep going. All right, here's the answer. The length of the telescope is slightly shorter than F0 plus Fe. And that's it. Next up, section 3. Let's just do the objectives and then we'll take a break. Section 3, Optical Phenomena. Predict whether light will be refracted or undergo total internal reflection. Recognize atmospheric conditions that cause refraction. Explain dispersion and phenomena, such as rainbows, in terms of the relationship between the index of refraction and the wavelength. Figure 10. <clears throat> A. This photo demonstrates several different paths of light radiated from the bottom of an aquarium B at the critical angle C, theta C, a light ray will travel parallel to the boundary. Any rays with an angle of incidence greater than theta C will be totally internally reflected at the boundary. That's the critical angle, C for critical. Total internal reflection, an interesting effect called total eternal reflection. Total internal reflection, the complete reflection that takes place within a substance when the angle of incidence of light striking the surface boundary 
is greater than the critical angle can occur when light moves along a path from a medium with higher index of refraction to one of lower index of refraction. Consider light rays traveling from water into air, as shown in figure 10a. Four possible directions of the rays are shown in the figure. At some particular angle of incidence called the critical angle, the angle of incidence at which the refracted light makes an angle of 90 degrees with the normal. The refracted ray moves parallel to the boundary, making the angle of refraction equal to 90 degrees, as shown in figure 10b. For angles of incidence greater than the critical angle, the ray is entirely reflected at the boundary, as shown in figure 10. This ray is reflected at the boundary as though it has struck a perfectly reflect reflecting surface. Its path and the path of all rays like it can be predicted by the law of reflection, that is, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. In optical equipment, prisms are arranged so that light entering the prism is totally internally reflected off the back surface of the prism. Prisms are used in place of silvered or aluminized mirrors because they reflect light more efficiently and are more scratch resistant. Snell's law can be used to find the critical angle. As mentioned above, when the angle of incidence theta i equals the critical angle theta c, then the angle of refraction theta r equals 90 degrees. Substituting these values into Snell's law gives the following equation. And that is for your perusal, that equation. Notice ni, notice nr, notice theta c, and notice the 90 degrees. Because the sine of 90 degrees equals 1, the following relationship results. Critical angle sine theta c equals index of refraction over the index of incidence, or ni is greater than nr. Sine critical angle equals the index of refraction of second medium equal over index of refraction of first medium. IFF, index of refraction of first medium, is greater than the index of refraction of the second medium. Note that this equation can be used only when Ni is greater than Nr. In other words, total internal reflection occurs only when light moves along a path from a medium of higher index of refraction to a medium of lower index of refraction. In other words, in a swimming pool. Let's say you're, you're in a swimming pool and you look up. You can see straight up and out to the sky, but if you look at an angle, it's totally reflected. Continuing, if Ni were less than Nr, this equation would give sine critical angle is greater than 1, which is impossible results because, by definition, the sine of an angle can never be greater than 1. When the second substance is air, the critical angle is small for the substance with large indices of refraction. Diamonds, which have an index of refraction of 2.419, have a critical angle of 24.4. By comparison, the critical angle for crown glass a very clear optical glass where n is 1.52 is 41.0 degrees. Because diamonds have such a small critical angle, most of the light that enters a cut diamond is totally internally reflected. The reflected light eventually exits the diamond from the most visible faces of the diamond. Jewelers cut diamonds so that the maximum light entering the upper surface is reflected 
back to these faces. <clears throat> Sample problem C, find the critical angle for a watery water-air boundary if the index of refraction is 1.33. There's what's given. And use the equation for the critical angle on this page. There's the critical angle equation. So you're simply going to plug in and chug it out and make sure that the ratio is less than 1, which it is. So the critical angle is 48.6 degrees. Remember that the critical angle equation is valid only if the light is moving from a higher to a lower index of refraction. So the, the ratio has to be less than 1 or equal to 1. Glycerin is used to make soap and other personal care products. Find the critical angle for light traveling from glycerin, 1.473, into air. 1.473 into air. So it's going to be Ni, Nr, and set it up. Remember, you're going from the one with a high index of refraction to one with a low index of refraction. So it's going to be 42.8 degrees. Calculate the critical angle for light traveling from glycerin into water. Aha! We did glycerin into air. Now do glycerin into water. What is going to be the critical angle? Here we go. You want to list what you have. You want to put down your equation and then simply plug into your equation. Very simple calculations. Some of the simplest calculations in physics all year. 64.82 degrees, rather large. Ice has a lower index of refraction than water. Find the critical angle for light traveling from ice, 1.309 into air. From ice into air. So if you're looking, if you're under the ice in a pond, which you shouldn't be, but if you were, and you looked up, at what angle would the light reflect back? And you list what you have, 1 divided by 1.309, take the arc sine, 49.8 degrees. Which has a smaller index, critical angle in air, diamond or cubic zirconium? Show your work. Okay. Let's look at diamond first, which has a smaller critical angle, diamond or, or cubic zirconia. Well, you, you can actually tell, I suppose, what's going to have a, a smaller ratio. So diamond is going to have a ratio of 1 over 2.4, let's round it, as opposed to 1 over 2.2. And diamond has a critical angle of 24.4 and cubic zirconia will have a value of 27. So it will, the answer is cubic zirconia. We see an example of refraction every day. The sun can be seen even after it has passed below the horizon. Rays of light from the sun strike Earth's atmosphere and are bent because the atmosphere has an index of refraction different from that of the near vacuum of space. The bending of the situation is gradual and continuous because the light moves through layers of air that have a continuously changing index of refraction. Our eyes follow them back along the direction from which they appear to have come. Refracted light produces mirages. A mirage is another phenomena in nature produced by refraction in the atmosphere. A mirage can be observed when the ground is so hot that the air directly above it is warmer than the air at higher elevations. Next, we're going to look at another why it matters. And we're going to look at optical fiber. Another interesting application of total internal reflection is the use of glass or transparent plastic rods like the one shown in the photograph, to transfer light from one place to another. And in that light, you can put data. Light is guided along a fiber by multiple internal 
reflections. Okay, as indicated in the illustration below, light is confined to travel within the rods, even around gentle curves. As a result of successive internal reflections, such a light pipe can be flexible if thin fibers rather than thick rods are used. It makes a nice decoration, but it also has a serious application. If a bundle of parallel fibers is used to construct an optical transmission line, images can be transferred from one point to another. This technique is used in a technology known as fiber optics. Where I live right now, sharks love, evidently, allegedly, sharks like to eat the optical fiber cables, and we sometimes don't have internet where I live as a result of that. Very little light intensity is lost in these fibers as a result of reflections on the sides. Any loss of intensity is due essentially to reflections from the two ends and absorption by the fiber material. Here is a little bit of a cross-section of the optical fiber, gives you a little bit of the anatomy involved here. Fiber optic devices are particularly useful for viewing images produced at inaccessible locations. For example, a fiber optic cable can be threaded through the esophagus and into the stomach to look for ulcers. It's called endoscopic, endoscopy. If you have something wrong with your stomach or esophagus or duodenum. Fiber optic cables are widely used in telecommunications because the fibers can carry much higher volumes of telephone calls and computer signals than can electric wires. All right, going back to the text, figure 11 talks about a mirage is produced by the bending of light rays in the atmosphere when there are large temperature differences between the ground and the air. Study the diagram carefully. It will help you understand the mirage. These layers of air at different heights above Earth have different densities and different refractive indices. The effect, that, uh, the effect this can have is pictured in figure 11. In this situation, the observer sees a tree in two different ways. One group of light rays reaches the observer by the straight line path A. And the eye traces these rays back to see the tree in the normal fashion. A second group of rays travels along the curved path B. These rays are directed towards the ground and are then bent as a result of refraction. Consequently, the observer also sees an inverted image of the tree by tracing these rays back to the point at which they appear to have originated. Because both an upright image and an inverted image are seen when the image of the tree is observed in a reflecting pool of water, the observer subconsciously calls upon this past experience and concludes that a pool of water must be in front of the tree. Aha, uh -huh. mystery solved. Dispersion. An important property of the index of refraction is that its value is anything but a vacuum depends on the wavelength of light. Because the index of refraction is a function of wavelength, Snell's law indicates that incoming light of different wavelength is bent at different angles as it moves into a refracting material. This phenomenon is called dispersion. Dispersion, the process of separating polychromatic light into its component wavelengths. As mentioned in section 1, the index of refraction decreases with increasing wavelength. Figure 12, when white light enters a prism, the blue light is bent more than the red. 
and the prism disperses the white light into its various spectral components. Study figure 12 very carefully. Carefully indeed. For instance, blue light with a wavelength around 407 nanometers bends more than red light, 650 nanometers, when passing into a refracting material. White light passed through a prism produces a visible spectrum. To understand how dispersion can affect light, consider what happens when light strikes a prism as in figure 12. Because of dispersion, the blue component of the incoming ray is bent more than the red component and the rays that emerge from the second face of the prism fan out in a series of colors known as the visible spectrum. These colors in order of decreasing wavelength are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet or indigo and violet, otherwise known as Roy G. Biv. That's Mr. Biv. Figure 13, rainbows A are produced because of dispersion of light in raindrops. Sunlight is spread into a spectrum upon entering a spherical raindrop B, then internally reflected on the back side of the raindrop. The perceived color of each water droplet then depends on the angle at which the drop is viewed. Again, nothing like a picture tells a thousand words. Study the diagrams, they will help more than the text. Rainbows are created by dispersion of light in water droplets. The dispersion of light into a spectrum is demonstrated most vividly in nature by a rainbow, often seen by an observer positioned between the sun and a rain shower. When a ray is of sunlight strikes a drop of water in the atmosphere, it is first refracted at the front surface of the drop with the violet light refracting the most and the red light the least. Then, at the back surface of the drop, the light is reflected and returns to the front surface where it again undergoes refraction as it moves from water into air. The rays leave the drop so that the angle between the incident white light and the returning violet ray is 40 degrees and the angle between the white light and the returning red is 42 degrees as shown in 13b. Now consider 13a. When an observer views a raindrop high in the sky the red light reaches the observer, but the violet light, like the other spectral colors, passes over the observers because it deviates from the path of the white light more than the red light does. Hence, the observer sees this drop being red. Similarly, a drop lower in the sky would direct violet light towards the observer and appear to be violet. The red light from this drop would strike the ground and not be seen. The remaining colors of the spectrum would reach the observer from raindrops lying between these two extreme positions. Note that rainbows are most commonly seen above the horizon where the ends of the rainbow disappear into the ground. However, if an observer is at an elevated vantage point, such as on an airplane or at the rim of a canyon, a complete circular rainbow can be seen. That's curious. A complete circular rainbow can be seen if you're high above the canyon. Curious. Lens aberrations. One of the basic problems of lenses and lens systems is the imperfect quality of the image. The simple theory of mirrors and lenses assumes that rays make small angles with the principal axis and that all rays reaching the lens or mirror from a point source are focused at a single point, producing a sharp image. 
Clearly, this is not always true in the real world, where the approximations used in this theory do not hold. Imperfect images are formed. As with spherical mirrors, spherical aberration occurs for lenses also. It results from the fact that the focal points of light rays far from the principal axis of a spherical lens are different from the focal points of rays with the same wavelengths passing near the axis. Interesting. Because of dispersion, white light passing through a converging lens is focused at different focal points for each wavelength of light. The angle in this figure are exaggerated for clarity. So the violet will converge differently than the red. Rays near the middle of the lens are focused farther from the lens than rays at the edges. Another type of aberration called chromatic aberration, the process of separating polychromatic light into its component wavelengths, arises from the wavelength dependence of refraction. Because the index of refraction of a material varies with wavelength, different wavelengths of light are focused at different focal points by the lens. For example, when white light passes through a lens, violet light is refracted more than red light, as shown in figure 14, the previous slide. Thus, the focal length for red light is greater than that for violet light. Other colors, wavelengths, have intermediate focal points because a diverging lens has the opposite shape. The chromatic aberrations for a diverging lens is opposite that for a converging lens. Chromatic aberrations can be greatly reduced by the use of a combination of converging and diverging lenses made from two different types of glass. Section review. We are almost finished. Find the critical angle for light traveling from water into ice. Critical angle. So I'll just let this roll, see if you can figure it out. That's what's given. There's the equation. Pretty straightforward. You're going to plug in arc sine of that ratio and you're going to get 79.11 degrees. Very large. Which of the following describes places where a mirage is likely to appear? A. Above a warm lake on a warm day. Above an asphalt road on a hot day. Above a ski slope on a cold day. Above the sand on the beach on a hot day. Above a black car on a sunny day. So A, B, and C, D, and E. So above a warm lake on a warm day, above an asphalt road on a hot day. Looks like it's going to be a hot day. Looks like it might be B, D, and E. Consider those. Not sure a cold day on a ski slope is going to do it. All right, there you go. Above a asphalt road on a hot day, above the sand on a beach on a hot day, and above a black car on a sunny day. Well done. When white light passes through a prism, which will be bent more, the red or the green light? Red or green? Roy G. Biv. So red is about in the middle of the spectrum, visible spectrum. So what will be bent more? Green light. Aha, the plot thickens. Critical thinking. After a storm, a man walks onto his porch. Looking to the east, he sees a rainbow that has formed above his neighbor's house. What time of day is it? Morning or evening? Evening, because the sun must be behind him to see the rainbow. Curious. Evening, because the sun must be behind him to see the rainbow. All right, let's look at the key ideas from each section. According to Snell's law, as a light ray travels from one medium into another medium where its speed is different, the light ray will change its direction unless it travels along the normal. <clears throat> when light 
passes from a medium with a smaller index of refraction to one with a larger index of refraction, the ray bends towards the normal. For the opposite situation, the ray bends away from the normal. Section 2. The image produced by a converging lens is real and inverted. When the object is outside the focal length and virtual and upright, when the object is inside the focal point. Diverging lenses always produce upright virtual images. The location of an image created by a lens can be found using either a ray diagram or the thin lens equation. Section 3, Optical Phenomena. Total internal reflection can occur when light attempts to move from a material with a higher index of refraction to one with lower index of refraction. If the angle of incidence of a ray is greater than the critical angle, the ray is totally reflected at the boundary. Mirages and the visibility of the sun after it has physically set are natural phenomena that can be attributed to refraction of light in Earth's atmosphere. The end.